Hi, I'm Jeff Cunningham, professor at Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Thunderbird School of Global Management, and this is IconicVoices.tv. In 1991, off the coast of Massachusetts and as far south as Bermuda, a horrendous nor'easter overturned a merchant fishing ship. When the storm turned into a hurricane, the National Weather Service refused to give it a name because they felt it would confuse the media, which is how a young journalist, Sebastian Junger, came to call it the perfect storm. Dennis Kozlowski was CEO of Tyco, one of the largest companies in the world and among the most successful CEOs, when he ran into his perfect storm. One might conclude that Kozlowski was tempting fate by living in Massachusetts and spending time in Bermuda where the company was headquartered. Otherwise, there's no quick answer for the 11-year black hole of trial and incarceration that overturned his world. Nor is there an easy explanation for how the media confused sensationalism with actual charges. Google Dennis Kozlowski and you won't find a single mention of the Tyco bankruptcy or the staggering cost to shareholders. Why? because Tyco was and is a thriving company that never went bankrupt. Shareholders gained and not lost under Dennis Kozlowski's leadership. Was it that a venerable 85-year-old New York District Attorney, Robert Morkenthau, who hails from a patrician family dating back to FDR's Treasury Secretary, decided to make an example of a profligate CEO in order to enhance his chances for re-election? Or was the avarice portrayed by the media a sign of something rotten in the American business fabric that needed to be redressed. Redressed it was. Kozlowski was sentenced to a term greater than many rapists and murderers, and the only public outcry was for more. So why was bringing down Kozlowski among the New York DA's most cherished ambitions? For that, you'll have to hear the tale and decide for yourself. Once again, Dennis Kozlowski. When exactly did you decide to have Franz Kafka write your life story? <laughs> it's something certainly very Kafka-esque about you know, what happened to me uh, over the last you know, 15 years or so. And you went from being one of the most admired CEOs in the country. There was one year when you were, if I'm not mistaken, the highest paid CEO in the country. There was. You went from being a CEO to being a convict. That's correct. Most of us never experience a transition as difficult as that in life, other than having to do with health. Was there any way that you could prepare to make that kind of a, a transition? Well, well, there really wasn't. You know, uh, by the same way, there's no way to really prepare to become a CEO of a company that's doing $40 billion a year in revenue in 60 different countries and having one of the largest market caps in the world. Uh, to one day finding yourself on, on the other end of a district attorney's prosecution and winding up in a prison. I, I've gone from the highest of highs possible to having jets and everything at my beck and call to go to any place in the world I needed to go to to conduct business to being in a New York State uh, prison. But the truth is that you weren't always in the high and mighty you actually had a very, very humble beginning. That's correct. Extreme blue collar uh, upbringing. Uh, we all lived in ethnic neighborhoods. Uh, there were Polish neighborhoods, Italian neighborhoods, Jewish neighborhoods. Uh, that's the way Newark was broken up at the time. Uh, there's, I lived in a uh, three family called cold water flat. We had heat in the kitchen, uh, there, a, cold, a cold stove in the kitchen, no heat any place else. No shower, it was a bathtub. This is the guy that went on to make in one year $100 million. That's correct, that's what happened. How, how does that happen in the, same life, in the same lifetime? When I came out of college, I uh, did the best I could in each job, found myself to be rapidly promoted uh, to higher and more significant levels of responsibility. And then I was in, uh, becoming a CEO uh, isn't something you're normally promoted to. It, it takes a number of factors. Uh, there has to be a vacancy, and you're at the top of the pyramid now, so there are fewer vacancies there are there than there are further down the pyramid. Uh, 
you have to be elected by a board of directors. So a board has to agree uh, that uh, you're the right person at the right time uh, for, for the job. So all those factors lined up for me, and, and there's luck. And I was lucky to be there at that time. Um, <clears throat> on the 100 million, does, does the CEO set his or her own salary? CEO does not. In a public company, a compensation, a compensation committee uh, sets your salary. So the compensation committee, typically using consultants, uh, 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 makes a determination as to what it needs to do to keep you there and keep you motivated. In the time that you were CEO, roughly what would you say was the increase in your market value? At, at that time, uh, my, from, from early on as being CEO, I was paid a million dollars a year. That was the max that CEOs can make. But through stock options and bonuses, uh, Hurdles were set. If you, if you performed, uh, you were paid. If you didn't perform, you weren't paid. So my market value at that time, you know, over that period, went from about a million dollars a year to virtually unlimited. Uh, because as if you're given a grant of some stock, and that stock price goes way up uh, uh, because of your performance, presumably, or you know, just you know, the whole market has. You're proportionate to the you're value of the stock. That, yes. Uh, and what about the company's market value? What, what kind the, of? The company market value went up significantly. When I became CEO, I was chief operating officer. It's a stepping stone to CEO. When I, I was chief operating officer, the market value of Tyco just about cleared a billion dollars. At the height of my CEO tenure, uh, the market value of Tyco was about $140 billion. That was more than General Motors, Ford Motor Company, and Chrysler combined, you know, at that time. So it increased 139 billion. Exactly. Round yes. numbers. Yes. What was your cash compensation? My cash compensation continued to be $1 million a year. So, so everything was in the stock? Every, everything was in the stock, and everything was on the table. So. Were you the best M&A guy in the world at that time? If I, I, I have an M&A practice right now. I still think I'm the best M&A guy in the world. So. Uh, his long suit is modesty. Uh, if you're the best M&A person and you're in a business that's growing through deal making, yes. you really have a talent that fuels that business. You cannot be replaced, at least not easily. Right. And, and it's not up to the CEO himself. You're able to build a team of people uh, that can get the job done. And uh, we were able to do that. We, we did more deals at Tyco in a year than all the Wall Street combined. If you, were, if you quit, got hit by a bus while, while you were CEO, what are the kinds of names the board would have to have looked at in order to replace you at your uh, level of talent? Yeah, they, they, they would be looking at names of people who were uh, running big companies. And, in, you know, not to these particular people, but people that were working for, say, Jack Walsh or Larry Bossidy or uh, people who were, you know, the names of CEO ship, you know, back at that time. Would you say there would be a list of, a short list of 20 people that would have that skill? Perhaps, yes. You know, I, I, I never thought about it that way, but, you know. The, the, the point I'd like to illustrate, we recently had a Powerball lottery. The... Uh, Three winners split a billion and a half, right? And the uh, odds of winning were one in 292 million. So if you're willing to take a chance to be one in 292 million, you, you should be worth uh, half a billion dollars. I mean, the lottery is probably as good a judge of market value as anything. Dennis's talent as a global CEO makes him one of 20 people in the world, world of seven billion plus people, it says that you have a much better shot at being a winner of the Powerball lottery than you do becoming a CEO. And I, and I say that because it tries to illustrate these numbers are very hard to contemplate, $100 million a year, but you have to put it in terms of how many people there are in the world that do the job. We want to talk about your prison experience. Before then, I'd, I'd like to shed a little bit of background. Do you think the tragedy of 9-11 cast a pall over the environment in which you were being scrutinized? I, I think 9-11 did, but I, I think 
the biggest pall was cast by Enron, by, uh, by the fall of Enron and then WorldCom. Uh, before that, CEOs were sort of heroes. Uh, the economy was strong uh, in the United States throughout the 90s. Uh, the wind was at our back. You know, most of the time, markets were going up, stock markets were going up, and people in general were doing well. Uh, after Enron and WorldCom, uh, CEOship hit a wall, and, and we went from being good guys to being bad guys. What was the uh, cost of your bankruptcy? Uh, there's no bankruptcy at Tyco. Tyco shareholders continue to, to thrive, uh, the company to this day. Uh, it's, it's four or five different companies now, but the company to this day is thriving. So the $140 billion company, if you were to put those pieces back together, would still have the same or more or, or significant yeah, I, value? It, it'd be over $200 billion today. So, so. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a growth story. Yes, it is. Yes. And uh, you win some, you lose some, and then there's this third way. Yes. Okay, so the point we're making is that there was a black cloud over the business world. There was. Uh, and the media played its role in that, perhaps fairly so, but the, bl the black cloud meant that there was going to be a level of scrutiny that was never applied before. There was also an interest in pursuing white collar crime, was there not? Yeah, there was, Jeff. I, I think, you know, you, you just mentioned the media played a role. Uh, I think the media loves to put people on a pedestal. And in the 90s, it was putting CEOs on a pedestal for certain. And then the media loves to tear people off the pedestal. And as soon as Enron and WorldCom happened, um, a lot of CEOs became you know, suspect. And a lot of questions that weren't asked prior to that were being asked subsequent to that. Some fairly, some you know, maybe relatively unfairly. Would you say it was a change in what we call the zeitgeist, the the culture just looked at it differently? Oh, and positively. It was a sea change you know, that took place in America. Um, so. The other thing is a fellow that you didn't know very well, but you got to know extremely well, named Robert Morgenthau. That's correct. Yeah. So Robert Morgenthau was the New York Attorney General? Uh, he was the Attorney General of Manhattan. Uh, New York City has five attorney generals, so each borough of New York has its own AG. But he has the power actually to move industries, does he not? He does. Uh, because the uh, New York Stock Exchange is in New York, companies traded on the New York Stock Exchange uh, uh, are sort of under his jurisdiction, or, or he can claim jurisdiction anyway. Typically it's the federal government that's looking at white collar crime, uh, but in this case the uh, the Attorney General of the Borough of Manhattan you know, stepped up and, and prosecuted me. Was he looking for a fall guy, in your opinion? In, in my opinion, he was. People had lost money in the stock market. In uh, 2001, uh, uh, the dot-com era uh, came to an end. Uh, company that were in communications, uh, any dot-com kind of idea, uh, went up with, came out with robust values, even though they hardly had sales or had a minimal amount of sales. Uh, a lot of these issues were way overpriced, uh, and then it all came crashing down, and people were upset that, you know, their investments didn't pay off, that CEOs were doing well, and I, I think, you know, it, it, it became a time uh, when you were looking for you know, somebody to... So uh, he's in the hunt yes. for a really juicy white collar guy. Right. And guess who comes across his radar? Yeah, I, I raised my hand, yeah. Uh, was it the tax on the art? Is that what brought you to his attention first? That, that, that was the initial uh, foray into, into Dennis Kozlowski. So the claim was that you had taken, or you'd taken possession of art that belonged to the company and that you hadn't paid taxes on it. That's that correct. Yes. And what's your response to that? Well, well at, at the end of the day, uh, this case was, uh, was uh, thrown out by the judge. It was dismissed. But, yeah, it was dismissed. But for a year and a half, uh, I was prosecuted for a failure to pay sales tax on art. I was the first consumer in the history of New York uh, to be prosecuted that way. Uh, typically, if you go into a store and you buy something, the, uh, the merchant collects the sales tax and submits it to the state. In my case, 
uh, the theory was, even though I bought the art outside of New York since I uh, had a couple pieces of the art in New York, I was to pay a use tax on that art. Uh, I didn't know that. So now the case is dismissed. Does Morgenthau go away? No, not at all. I, actually, once, once I was indicted on sales tax, I had to resign my position at Tyco because you really can't be an effective CEO while you're fighting an indictment. Once I left Tyco, uh, a few months later, other charges were levied against me. You're saying you were wrongfully, based on the fact that the charges were dismissed, you were wrongfully accused of stealing and not paying taxes and all that nonsense on the art. And as a result of that, the board fired you. And yes. then subsequently, the ch charges were dismissed. There was also the case of a birthday party. That's right. And if you'll Google, this will come up. It was a considered, uh, this was in uh, the press, a Bacchanalian birthday party. Uh, at which you were accused of uh, making the company pay a million dollars for. We were having a conference uh, on the island of Sardinia. And we were a big company doing business in 60 different countries. During that conference, my wife at the time, not to be confused with my loving and wonderful wife who was here today, uh, my, my wife uh, at that time uh, was celebrating a 40th birthday. And I threw a party one of the evenings during that conference you know, for her. And uh, uh, the instructions were any, any cost related to that party, any incremental cost you know, whatsoever, just charged to me personally. And about $1.2 million of that cost was charged to me pers you know, personally. And the chief financial officer of the company, the party planner, everybody was told the same thing. Uh, so I, I, I paid for that. Now, had I known sitting here today, or you know, had I known years ago that somehow, some way, there was going to be, you know, the, the, all the uh, publicity and everything that centered around this party, there's no way I would have done that. I just thought it'd be convenient. I'm paying for it. So what's the difference? Uh, is uh, is one of your notes to self? Do not allow videotapes at parties? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I didn't think there were videotapes at, at the parties. Uh, I mean, there were children at the parties. There were other directors there. There was nothing to hide. It wasn't quite the thing that was made out to be in the courtroom. Uh, but the videotape was played in the courtroom. It had nothing to do with the charges levied against me, but it had everything to do with the district attorney influencing the jury. What was your feeling and a jury was selected? What did you think when you walked into the courtroom the first day, when you looked around? Well, it was, it was surreal. You no, know, I could not believe that somehow I got to this position. Uh, I was you know, coming into a, a Manhattan courtroom. A, a jury was being picked. I had very serious charges uh, levied against me. The DA worked hard to try to throw me into jail before the trial started, saying I was a flight risk and, uh, um, you know, claiming a lot of other issues. Uh, uh, in fact, the, the DA would not allow me to use my own money for bail. They set, uh, they set bail at $100 million, uh, as if I was going to you know, run away or something. Now, fortunately at the time, a group of friends of mine from New England, uh, from the island of Nantucket, uh, pretty much fishermen, uh, people who own inns, got together and put up all of their assets, their homes, their inns, their fishing boats, their trucks and motorcycles. Uh, and they presented that to the judge you know, to keep me out of jail. Uh, uh, so, so there was a strong show of community support for me you know, at that time. What would possess a fisherman to put up his only valuable possession, his house, for your bail? It, it, was, it was friendship. It was you know, people that I knew. Uh, uh, I was involved in a number of causes uh, in Massachusetts on Nantucket. And, and it was people giving back to me who, you know, where I was giving in the community. When you looked at the jury, did you see anyone else there that looked like an M&A expert? No, no, the, the, the judge explained 
the trial was going to take a long time, that it was going to take months. Uh, he estimated four months. And the first trial took six months. Uh, but if you have a career or you're doing things, there's no way you could sit in a courtroom for, for four months, you know, which, you know, which he thought it might be. And you know, it's, it's relatively easy for a juror to get away from that. Can a career stand a four-month hiatus yeah, for jury duty? I, yeah, I, I don't know of anybody who can. And that's, that's really unfortunate because I would urge you given an opportunity to accept jury duty because jurors need bright people on them that can really figure out right from wrong. You know, I can tell you that from my experience. In your case, did you not get a typical jury pool? I didn't. Uh, I think on my first there was absolutely nobody there that understood what a corporation does or what a compensation committee might be or you know, why there are auditors. It, it, you know, it, it didn't exist. Uh, the, the jury was, uh, was not college educated you know, for the most part. Uh, so it was far from what you tend to believe that you will have a jury of your peers. Uh, there, were, there, there were no peers on the jury. But did that play into the prosecution's hands because the jury was treated to uh, colorful and graphic exposure of your party, of your art issue, things that they could actually understand. And so they were treated to the video, which... That's correct. Did that have anything to do with the charges? It had absolutely nothing at all to do with the charges. I was not indicted on anything whatsoever, no, with the party. Why show them the video? Well, that was the argument. We, you know, uh, the defense side argued hard that that video had no business in the courtroom. Uh, and the prosecutor argued hard that it was part of my lifestyle and it was how I spent my money. And the jurors should get to see that. Uh, and at that time, too, the prosecutors were arguing that I spent company money on this, on this uh, party. It was only until witnesses came into the courtroom who testified that I didn't you know, uh, spend company money on the birthday party side of the, side of the conference. The, the, the major allegation, and the one in which you were convicted, and the one I presume in which the sentence was based, was the, the theft of your, your bonus, essentially. That's exactly, yes. So you were, it was 80 million? The bonus. Yes, eighty million dollars. Okay. So, the allegation was that Dennis was paid eighty million dollars in a bonus, in, in, in a number of bonuses, in four different bonuses, four bonuses, and that it had not been approved, and I guess therefore, if it hadn't been approved, you stole it. Now, how did they arrive at the four bonuses totaling eighty million? If you if if you didn't steal it, there must have been a formula by which that number came to to begin with. Yes, I had a I had an agreement, a contract with the company, and the bonuses were paid on four separate, highly profitable transactions that the company did. So they were mathematically calculated, and myself, the CFO, and a lot of other employees received bonuses on those transactions. Uh, we all had an agreement and uh, the bonuses you know, were not only paid to me, but to 50, 60, 70 other employees in the company. So you had a contract approved by the board? Approved by the board, yes. A contract? And, and, and I believe shareholders also. Approved by the board and shareholders, stipulating the way in which your bonus would be paid or calculated rather. How is that not an approved bonus? There, there was a, a quirk that was brought into the equation by uh, the prosecutor uh, and, and by the lawyer representing uh, the company that even though the bonuses were earned, they weren't appropriately approved and they needed to be approved by the minutes of the compensation committee. The, the formula was approved, the contract was approved by the comp committee, the, the money was, the company's profits were earned on those transactions. The math was done correctly. However, there was a step that nobody thought about or considered and that another approval was needed by the board before those bonuses were paid. Uh, not, uh, you know, to me, to the CFO, and to everybody else that received those bonuses. 
for lack of some kind of documentary bureaucratic papering, you were convicted of theft. That's correct. That's correct. I, I think if, if you go full circle here, uh, there's a book out, not written by me, but written by an ethics professor from the University of North Kentucky called Taking Down the Lion by Catherine Neal. And it's nobody that I knew or hired or had anything to do with. But you no, know, she did a sabbatical and spent a couple of years researching the book, interviewing jurors and, and the DA. And uh, it's well documented in the book that the bonuses were, were earned. And uh, I'm not telling anybody to go out and buy a book. I have no vested interest in it. But, but it does a very good explanation of this. But there's also a motive you know, uh, by Tycho not to pay those bonuses and to find me guilty of a crime uh, because I had something called a retention bonus uh, uh, at Tyco. Uh, at one point in time, after about 25 years there, I decided this is long enough at Tyco and I want to go off and do something else. And I had offers to go off and do something else. Uh, but I stayed because I was given a huge retention bonus. When you add in everything that was involved, it came in the neighborhood of $300 million, an, an, enormous, an enormous bonus to hang around for another seven years. Uh, and it was modeled after the Jack Walsh retention bonus that, that GE had. So, it, and the only way that I would not be paid that bonus if I was found guilty of a crime, materially injurious to Tyco, when I was indicted on sales tax, uh, and had to leave the company, a couple of directors worried they would have to pay me that bonus and be embarrassed because the sales tax was not materially injurious to Tyco. So you fast forward and the lawyers figured out, oh, look at that, that his other bonuses were not approved uh, even though they were earned. And no, that's a crime. And that's materially injurious to Tyco. How many other White 60 or 60 CEOs were in prison with you? Uh, none. Yeah, it was me. What was, the, what was the inmate population demographically? Uh, demographically, it was uh, typically about 80% uh, young black men, uh, probably another 12, 14% of young Hispanics, and about 6% you know, uh, white males. And then the lion. Yes. <laughs> Uh, what were the kind of crimes that most of the 80% African Americans were in for? A, a lot of drug crimes. Uh, petty? Uh, pe petty drug crimes. Uh, 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 carrying, selling uh, marijuana. Uh, you know, uh, a, a lot of that. Uh, You're devoting a part of your time and a certain part of your life today to issues like mass incarceration and prison reform. Yeah, I, I think there, there, is a, there is a big movement now on the fact that America has locked up a lot of people in prison who really didn't deserve to be in prison is, is that a, a great, uh, 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 there was a great miscarriage of justice there, not only to the people that have been locked up, but to the families that have suffered you know, through that. Uh, so I'm involved with something called the Fortune Society in New York, uh, which I chair. Fortune Society has been around for a long time. And uh, last year we serviced over 8,000 clients of people coming out of jail. Uh, we, we provide housing, uh, we provide job skills, uh, we have training centers, uh, and, and do a lot to stop the recidivism that's people going, going back to prison. Uh, my wife is involved in the uh, Women's Prison Association uh, and WPA, uh, which does the same thing, but with a focus on on, on women who have, who have been incarcerated and, are, and seek alternatives uh, to incarceration. What can ordinary people do who want to help improve the situation? It's something I never thought about in my life, right? I mean, who, who goes around thinking about prisons when you're you know, um, running a, uh, working your way up uh, in responsibilities and, and you wind up uh, uh, running a big company through, you know, through luck, through skill, through you know, a, whole, a whole host of things that happen at the right time in your life. Uh, but once you're there, you, know, you do start thinking about it and you look around. I got involved in teaching GED 
uh, uh, things you know, while there. Uh, but uh, I knew that just helping somebody get a GED wasn't going to make much of a difference when they came out if they couldn't get a job or had no place to go. When you leave a state prison in New York, you give them $40 and a bus ticket back to Manhattan. That's it. Uh, so you just spent five, seven years there. You may never had a visitor. Uh, the telephone calls were the most expensive in the country. It was about $4 a minute to talk on the phone. And, and you had to you had to reverse the charges at all times. So there was, um, uh, uh, you know, the inmates have you know, little communication, but in beginning to think about it, you know, we got this wrong, you know, we really do. This is a population that politicians don't spend a lot of time thinking about. They're not great voters. Yeah, but, but, but politicians caused it because each successive politician wanted to be tougher on crime than his predecessor. Uh, so as, you know, as we came out of three strikes and you're out and um, we came out of the drug area, uh, drug era, and we thought the answer to that was incarceration. Well, if the last guy said you should serve four years for a crime, the next guy says you need to serve six years. I'm tougher than my opponent. And, and that's part of the reason why we got there. The other, the other is employment. Uh, uh, upstate New York uh, has very few industries. And the biggest proponent for long prison terms for three, three strikes you're out are the Prison Guard Association. Uh, and they're, uh, I think it's something like 30,000 strong you know, in, in New York alone. And you know, that being the biggest employer upstate, it, it's job protection by having people come to prisons and stay there. Uh, Life's not easy when you get out of prison, but it's particularly not easy when you come from the, when you have the downfall that you experienced. Yes. Do you feel like people feel they have the right to judge you? I've, I've thought a lot about that. And uh, people who know me can judge me. You know, I'm, I'm fine with that. And people who don't know me who judge me, you know, and I don't mean this to sound arrogant. You know, I really don't care about it because they don't know me. They don't know who I am. Uh, they don't know, you know the first thing about me. Uh, they might have read a headline someplace. You know, something stuck with them. Uh, but so I'm, I'm indifferent to that. Is there anything we can do about prosecutorial overreach? You were indicted and convicted, and the prosecutor talks to the media, do they not? They do, yeah. Uh, when, when you're in court every day, uh, especially in my case, since it was, you know, a, a highly publicized case. At the end of, uh, I'd be in court and say, well, today was a good day. You know, we had good witnesses, uh, uh, you know, things went our way. And when I would read the newspapers the next day, it was nothing like what happened in court that day. Uh, what happened at the end of the day, the, the prosecutors hold a press conference. The press goes there and the prosecutors explain to the press what has happened. And when I was on trial, and, and I think this was a, a big mistake, and, and uh, you know, if I had to do over, this is one thing I, I would do over. My attorneys were old school, and they say, you don't talk to the media, you can't be interviewed, you, know, you can't go there. And so as a result, the prosecutor gets to write the story. And, and the story is running away from you way before you had a chance to say anything about it. Uh, and I, I think in a, in a, now with the internet and people getting their news from a lot of different sources, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't work as well. Back when I was growing up, you got your news from Walter Cronkite, you know, Chet Huntley and David Brinkley. You got your news from two or three or four news uh, companies, you know, news sources. This is what they did was news. Today, your news comes from thousands of places, you know, including chain letters on the internet. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and once somebody makes an opinion or is, is allowed to form an opinion, to change that opinion you know, is, is almost impossible. When I opened up to questions, my last question for you, has this experience in some strange, unknown way made you a better man? Uh, it, it, it's, it's, yes, you know, that's, that's the short answer. But it was, a, it was a very difficult experience. It was, it was hurtful. Uh, I never thought you know, I would be sitting in front of an audience like this, telling you what it's like to spend almost seven years 
in a, in a tough state prison. This was not camp cupcake, you know, uh, as you hear about in federal prison. This was the real deal. This is the toughest of all tough places I've ever, you know, ever found myself. And I said, and I grew up in, in Newark, New Jersey, and, but no, this was way worse than anything like that. But this experience, it certainly has made me sensitive to, to a lot of things that I wasn't sensitive you know, to before. And uh, while I had it tough, there's a lot of people in this country that have it tougher than me. Now, they're doomed from almost from birth. And uh, there, there are people who you know, wind up uh, in prison through almost no fault of their own. They can't appeal. There's no hope. Uh, they have no visitors. Uh, others, you know, my wife, you know, who was, you know, who was at the prison almost every weekend, my you know, children and family gave me tons of support you know, to get through this. Uh, but probably 5% of us who were in that prison had visitors. 95% had none. And you know, uh, so while I, you know, I feel bad for me about what I went through, I feel way worse for a whole lot of other people in this country you know, that, you know, uh, that have nothing to say, that don't have a say in the system, uh, that are not only being prosecuted, but almost persecuted you know, uh, just because they can be you know, by prosecutors. What was the biggest adjustment coming from such a extravagant lifestyle to prison for you in the first couple of weeks? It, it, it was the control others had over me. Uh, you can't put on a light. You, you, know, you can't open or close the door. Uh, you, you just had no control at all over your environment. Uh, I, was, I was in a cell that uh, was used for solitary confinement at one time. So I was, uh, my, my first nine months in prison, I was in a cell for 23 hours a day with nobody else around. Uh, and, 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 and there's a lot of talk about that now about you know, solitary and what have you. And, and there should be a lot of talk about it. But it was, uh, uh, it was the isolation and absolutely no control at all you know, over anything. Thank you. Well, I, you know, I... Is, is that the question? Is that the, am I a victim of certain... That's part of the question. Okay. And then the rest of the question is, so we just went through the financial collapse of 2008, 2009. No executives went to prison, and there's been an uproar about that. So my question is, how do you reconcile those two? And do you think that some of the executives should have gone to prison as a result of the financial collapse, and why do you think they didn't? Yes. Uh, I, I was a victim of circumstance, but I also did some dumb things. I think living high and having other people see that, you know, living with large houses, and uh, I, I, you know, I, if I had to do over on that, I, I wouldn't do that. I, you know, that, that was excessive, and, and you know, that just brought a lot of attention to me. So from, from that standpoint, you know, I was asking for something, you know, that, you know, and, and I got it. Uh, but I didn't do what I was prosecuted for. Uh, so if you want to kick me out of being the CEO or do something for living, you know, for living the way I was living, you know, I, I certainly would understand that. And you know, because in retrospect, you know, it, it, it wasn't the way to live. It, it, it was wrong. Fast forward to 2007, 2008, to the financial crisis. Uh, I do think uh, a lot of things were done intentionally wrong there. Uh, I do think that the rating agencies who continued to rate the, the bonds that were held, uh, that were the, the mortgage bonds, really messed up. And, and, and they were doing it because they were in agreement with the banks, you know, with, uh, with the banks that were holding the bonds. And it was only after they were able to dump the bonds did they drop the AAA ratings you know, from, you know, from those bonds. So uh, I, I don't wish prison on anybody. I really don't. I, you know, it's, it's a horrible, horrible place. But if others were prosecuted you know, during, during the 2001, 2, 3 era, I, I do think people deserve to be prosecuted. No, uh, in 2008. 
But I, I also think that the government didn't do it because you could bring down a lot of other fragile institutions at that time, you know, if you did go out and prosecute. What are your thoughts, I guess, on the current state of the, the exodus of U.S. companies uh, overseas to avoid income tax, and what do you think are the steps our government should take? Well, companies don't necessarily go overseas to avoid income tax, right? Com if you're a CEO of a company, your obligation is to give the best return you possibly can to your shareholders. And if you're an international company, uh, I, I did one of the first inversions ever. Uh, Tyco married up with ADT. ADT acquired Tyco, and we went offshore. That was one of the things that got me into the sights of the Manhattan District Attorney. Uh, however, your company, the company is a full taxpayer in the country it's doing business. So in the case of Tyco, for example, all the, all the business it did in, in the United States of America, it paid full, its full board, 35% or 36% taxes, whatever the corporate rate is. And if you're a German company, you're paying full taxes there. In an inversion, if you go to a low tax country like Ireland, which I think is 10% but going up, or Switzerland where you negotiate a rate, or Bermuda where there's a zero corporate income tax, you raise money at that level and then you loan the money out as if you were a bank under the same formula as a bank uses to your subsidiaries around the world. Your subsidiary gets a tax deduction on that loan for the interest it pays, uh, much the same as if it was paying interest to a bank or to a finance company. However, when the money is returned back to Ireland or Switzerland or Bermuda, you're paying the effective tax rate there, uh, as opposed to paying a ta the, the tax rate as if you were loaning the money from the US. Now, the problem with the United States is it is not competitive with tax rates. It is not competitive at all on a worldwide basis. And no CEO, who had, and you could only do this if you were a multinational company. So, uh, and no CEO is responsible for keeping his company in the highest paid tax area of the world. The CEO is responsible for maximizing value for its owners, for, you know, for the shareholders. And, and what America really needs to do is to get competitive you know, with the rest of the world in corporate taxes. And you know, that no movement has been made to do that. But you, you know, you, you're not fighting the problem by trying to stop inversions because you really can't stop them uh, because there are companies all over the world that have different tax rates. So if you were the CEO of a US company competing against uh, a Swiss company, say in medical devices, and your Swiss company's paying 10% in taxes and you're paying 35%, and you know, he can he can reinvest in, or she can reinvest in R and D. You know, they can uh, make more products. Then they can be more productive. They can get state of the art equipment because they have more cash at the end of the day to do this. And that Swiss company is going to you know, outcompete you. you know, they're going to beat you in the marketplace. And that's the problem with this. Uh, there is a fix. The fix is to get competitive, corporate tax wise. It's such a good question. I just want to add that I think it's, it's a media issue. The media promotes the thesis that it's as if all your revenues are taxed at the level of your domicile. As Dennis pointed out, it's only the funds that are raised there. The, the revenues in each individual jurisdiction are subject to those taxes. But you'll hear politicians spouted as if you're not paying any taxes exactly. by an inversion. Right. And the media simply parrots that. Do you think that it might be better if we have like specific jury pools for different kinds of cases so that if there's a white collar crime, if there's people that have that business background, would that have better suited your case? Does that yeah, make well, sense? I, you know, uh, until, until my case came up, no, I believed in the jury system. I believed in the jury of your peers. In my case, in particular, you know, it didn't work. But there are a lot of complex things for a jury to understand. And if you had never been in a, in a you know, corporate boardroom, it's, it's difficult to understand you know, some of these things. Uh, but as I was sitting there, I thought a system of professional jurors 
would have been far preferable you know, to, uh, to the jurors that, uh, I went through two trials. The first trial was a hung jury. Uh, there was another eight months off. And then there was a second trial where I was ultimately convicted. Uh, uh, but I did wish you know, there was a jury of people that knew something about corporate governance, something about you know, compensation committees and auditors you know, sitting there. But you know, is it, you know, if, if I'm one or two percent uh, of the people who are going through that, uh, you know, should you change the whole system if the system works 90 percent of the time? No, I, you know, I don't know. But, but you know, some of the more sensationalized cases seem to have some of the, you know, some outcomes that didn't make sense to me. Uh, not only my case, but I can think of others. Uh, and you no, know, that would lend you no know, credence to a to a system of professional jurors.